Hi, I'm Dr. Jackson Crawford. I'm a specialist in the Old Norse language, currently finishing up two years of teaching at UC Berkeley before returning to the Rocky Mountains to teach at the University of Colorado Boulder in this fall. I'm back with another video about a topic in Norse language and myth, and today what I want to do is the uh, much requested how-to guide to Old Norse poetry. This is not only for if you want to compose poetry in an Old Norse style yourself, whether Eddic or Skaldic, but also for those who just want to learn to appreciate Old Norse poetry a little bit better. I find that one of the best ways to learn how to appreciate something is to learn how to do it yourself in the first place. So let's take a look at some of the broad concepts that are applicable to all or most forms of Old Norse poetry before we look at a few specific Eddic and Skaldic styles. For one thing, we have to remember that all Old Norse poetry uh, is very loath to use end rhyme. So something that we associate with rhymes and songs today uh, very strongly, the end rhyme of something like roses are red, violets are blue, inside I'm dead, and so are you, is almost un unseen in Old Norse. Instead, alliteration, the use of stress syllables that start with the same sound is what characterizes almost all Old Norse poetry. Now, let me show you a few examples of the kind of alliteration I mean. In these examples on the board here, I have used uh, way more alliteration than any Old Norse poem would use, uh, but the sort of overdose is so that I can give you more examples about things, and also to kind of get you thinking about what words alliterate and what don't. So here's a, these are all just crazy examples of me, don't read too much into them. Hawks hunger for heights to hunt hares from in the Mojave. Notice that this word Mojave has that sound H in English, uh, but it is spelled with a J, so we have to be careful in English especially that uh, words may sound the same, but they may spell the sound differently. So of course, this still alliterates. It also still alliterates even though this isn't the first uh, sound of the word. So this is a stressed syllable, and, and this is the second syllable, but this still counts as alliteration with the H's on the stressed initial syllables in these other words. Hawks, hunger, heights, hunt, hares, hav. Also, note that although in Old Norse this is actually in a sense easier because the stressed syllable is always the first syllable of the word in Old Norse, bar none. Uh, in English you can still usually tell which one is stressed by just kind of playing around with the word and trying stressing it in different places. Do you say Mojave? Or Mojave? No, you say Mojave, so the second syllable is the stressed one. Similarly, we have this example. Caliber is a comment on the circumference of the crater, not the competence of the cowboy. It's for all the 1911 guys out there. So, here we see again the stressed syllable is the uh, first one of most of these words, but in circumference, the second syllable is the stress syllable, and so since it starts with that k sound, uh, that can alliterate with these other ones, cal, com, crate, com, cal. Uh, also, of course, we could alliterate something that started with a k here, even though it's spelled differently because the sound is the same. Old Norse does specify one thing, which is that if an s is followed by a t or a k, it can only alliterate with other words that also have the st or the sk in it. So a word like staff doesn't alliterate with a word like circus or like uh, save, but it does alliterate with stick and style. A word like school doesn't alliterate with sore or sake, but it does alliterate with scornful and scalds. Again, notice the spelling is different for these three words, S-E-H, S-C, S-K, but they alliterate because the sound is the same in English. Also, Old Norse has a convention that all vowels alliterate with other vowels. So any word that starts with the vowel, owl, evening, earnest, ice, whatever, these all alliterate. And anything that starts with a y sound, of course spelled with a Y in English, but with a J in Old Norse, like Jotunheimr, that alliterates with vowels too. So owls yearn for evening, owls yearn and eve all alliterate with one another. Also keep in mind that what I am showing as alliterating is always a stressed syllable. Like I said, you cannot alliterate on unstressed syllables, so don't try it. King commanding crows. King and crows alliterate, 
but you cannot use the C in commanding to alliterate with these two words because it's not on a stressed syllable. The stressed syllable is an M. So watch out and don't use unstressed words to alliterate. So words like prepositions, of, from, in, on, by, with, those won't be used in alliteration and neither will uh, words and suffixes like ing, er, uh, etc. in English. All right, now the two main schools of Old Norse poetry are called Eric and Skaldic. Skaldic is named for the Old Norse word skold, which just means poet. Both styles do have in common the use of alliteration, and they have in common that they are stanzaic. Now, Old Norse poetry is closely related to the poetry of other Old Germanic languages, like Old English or Old High German. But if you read an Old English poem, a long poem like Beowulf, you'll notice that it's printed as one long body of text on the page. Whereas Old Norse poetry is printed in stanzas, usually of six to eight lines. The stanza format is a common characteristic of Old Norse, whether Eddic or Skaldic. Now those stanzas may be strung together into a very long poem, like Hovamal, for instance, is strung together out of 164, I think, stanzas uh, that are all back to back. But the uh, basic stanzaic structure is there, and the stanza is itself a sort of self-contained unit. There should be one complete thought in the stanza, if not even in the half stanza. So we're not going to have sentences that continue from stanza to stanza. All right, I'm going to be using examples when I talk about these different styles of poetry that are in Old Norse and in English. When I use Old Norse examples, keep in mind, as I'm always reminding people in my videos, that the pronunciation that I use is Old Norse reconstructed pronunciation, not modern Icelandic pronunciation. Mostly Old Norse is taught with modern Icelandic pronunciation, but I use reconstructed pronunciation because I think it's more authentic and it's very well established. If you want more information about this, I've linked a video on a card in the top right, and there's other videos on my channel about, for example, modern Icelandic pronunciation and how we know what dead languages sound like in the first place. All right, with that out of the way, let's take a look at Eric poetry. All right, the first Eric meter that I want to look at is Forirdislag. This literally means ancient words meter. And this is the meter that we most often see for narrative poems in the Poetic Edda, like Voluspo and similar narrative poems. We see a stanza of eight lines. And keep in mind that some translators and editors will print this as four lines. So with this is one line, this is one line, this is one line, and this is one line. Fordney of this log is essentially the same meter as in an Old English poem like Beowulf, of course arranged in stanzas because this is Old Norse. Uh, and in Old English is sort of a convention of printing uh, each line as half of a line. So these are half lines from an Old English perspective. And there are translators who will print it that way. Uh, I follow the Scandinavian convention of treating each half line as a line. It's just a matter of style. Whichever way you do it, the same remarks are applicable. It's just whether you print these on the same line or not. So anyway, considering it stands up of eight lines or four, depending on your perspective, each line has two stressed syllables. And one of those stressed syllables will alliterate with a stressed syllable in the next line. So an odd line alliterates with an even line, or one stress syllable from that odd line alliterates with a stress syllable in the next even line. So notice stress syllables first, veit, hein, hljor, folg. Depends kind of how you read this. I'd say und, hev, helg, bad, o, aus, arg, force. Probably vev, val, or well, it could be val, fort, vit, what. All right, so you got two stress syllables. One in each line is going to alliterate with one in an adjacent line. So here we've got hein, kyo, alliterate, he, hel, alliterate, aus, er, alliterate, or o, aur, alliterate. Any vowel alliterates with any other vowel. And vowel and fit alliterate. And that's pretty much it. Etic poetry is very simple in style. 
the uh, exact meter of a given line or rhythm of a given line in terms of where the stress and unstressed syllables lie is um, not fixed. So in English, in a meter like iambic uh, pentameter, you have unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. In Old Norse, it's not so much the pattern as it just is how many of them there are. So each line here will have two stressed, so veit heim, and then we'll have zero to four unstressed. Typically two or three, not very often zero, one, or four, but zero to four unstressed syllables. So unstressed syllables here, you've got hon and dalar. Here you've got um and it. It doesn't really matter, again, the pattern of the unstressed syllables. Uh, at a very fine level of analysis, some people have found patterns, uh, but I don't think that it matters beyond extremely detailed analysis of these poems, certainly for composing these poems in English, keeping in mind that you've got two stressed syllables in each line, zero to four unstressed syllables, one stressed syllable and an odd line will alliterate with one stressed syllable in the next even line. That's pretty much four near the slog. So let's give this a shot in English. All right, so here's my submission of a four near the slog poem in English. Hummingbirds battle fiercely, make war, mighty flyers, feather-covered fighters have no dread save of dying in peace. So we have two stressed syllables in each line. Hum, birds, bat, fierce, make war, might, fly, fed, cub, fight, have, dread, save, die, peace. One in each odd line alliterates with one in the next line. Birds, bat, make, might, fed, fight, dread, die. And then each line has zero to four unstressed syllables, not necessarily in any given pattern. Another meter that we see in the poetic era is Ljodhotr. Ljod is just one word for song or poem, and hotr means meter. Ljodhotr is particularly used in didactic or proverbial style, so in a poem like Hovamal, which contains a lot of proverbs and advice. This example is Hovamal stanza 9. So in Ljodhotr, lines 1 and 2 and line it's four and five. Notice we have a six-line stanza, not an eight-line stanza here, like in Four Near the Slog. Lines one and two and four and five are like Four Near the Slog lines. We have two stressed syllables and one stressed syllable in each line alliterates with one in the next line. So sal, silver, thvi, thig. The, uh, notice that in this first line, we actually have both stressed syllables in the first line alliterating with something in the second line. That's fine, but it's optional. So, uh, and it's rarely in the even lines that you'll see those two alliterating uh, syllables. Typically, that'll only be in odd lines. All right, so lines one and two and four and five look like four near the slog, but lines three and six are different. Line three that follows one and two does not alliterate with one and two. It, it could, but it doesn't have to. Instead, it is a line with three stressed syllables, not two, and two of those alliterate with each other in that line. So here we have lov, vit, liv stressed syllables, and two of them alliterate with each other, lov and liv. Similarly, line six works the same way. We have three stressed syllables, an, brios, or, and two of those alliterate with each other, on and or, because any vowel alliterates with any vowel. Uh, this is, that one is happy, who himself, about, has, so who has in himself, praise and intelligence while he lives. Because bad advice has a man often gotten another's heart breast from. So because a man has often gotten bad advice from someone else's heart. Now let's look at an English language example of Leo the Hotter. All right, this is my submission for an English language Leo the Hotter poem. You might detect some themes in my own writing. It's just what comes to me. A Wyoming creature craves some quiet. He'll suffer stoically himself. Babbling phones and booming speakers ain't much use to the elk raised. So in lines one and two and four and five, they just look like four near the slog. We have two stressed syllables in each line. Om, creech, craves, quai, bab, phone, boom, speak. And then we have zero to four unstressed syllables in each of those lines. In each of those lines, 
one stress syllable at least in the odd line alliterates with a stress syllable in the even line that follows. So creech craves, uh, bab, boom. But then in the third and sixth line, lines, these are independent. So in the third line, we have three stress syllables, sub, sto, self, and two of those alliterate with each other. So sub and self. Same in the sixth line, we have three stress syllables, ain't, use, elk, and two of those alliterate with each other, ain't and elk. Actually, all three of these alliterate because you starts with a y sound, and that's fine, again, for all three of those to alliterate, but it's not required, only two have to. All right, now the next kind of etic meter, galdrolag, is actually uh, sort of a form of leodhotr. All right, galdrolag is a modified form of leodhotr. Galdr means magic, magic spell, log is meter, so galdralog is literally the meter of magic spells. We don't find entire poems in the poetic edda in galdralog, but rather parts of longer poems will be in galdralog, usually when the speaker is talking about magic or is trying to achieve some kind of magic effect, apparently. So, for instance, at the end of Hovamal, when Odin is talking about the magic spells that he knows, he switches into galdralog to talk about them, and this is from that poem, this is stanza 156. So, if you just look at the first six lines, it looks just like Leodhotr. Lines one and two each contain two stress syllables, and then one stress syllable in the odd line alliterates with the stress syllable in the following even line. So, probably kan el are emphasized, probably skal or are emphasized, and el or alliterate, because any vowel alliterates any other vowel. And then you have line three, which uh, doesn't alliterate with the preceding lines, but has two stressed syllables that alliterate with each other, lathe and long. This probably has three stressed syllables, lathe, long, and vin, uh, but notice that in Galdralak, especially the third and sixth lines can have just two stress syllables instead of three. The other holter can do that too, but it's commoner in Galdralag. So here, for instance, we have just two stress syllables, hail and hild. They alliterate each other, of course, hail, hild. So again, the next three lines of this Galdralag stanza look just like your Yoda holter. One and two have two stress syllables, rand and und, or rand and gel, ther and rik, or rik and far, and then one stressed syllable in the odd line alliterates with one stressed syllable in the following even line, so ran, rik. And then we have a following sixth line that has that does not alliterate with the preceding lines, but has two stressed syllables that alliterate with each other, hil, hil. The difference with galdralag is then there are additional lines like the final sixth line. And you, you can have just one, you can have three. Uh, in this case, we have two additional lines. So they'll work just like a third or sixth line. They'll have two or three stress syllables. Two of them will alliterate with each other. So hail, hill here again, repeating the same alliterating elements of the preceding line. And then here, our stress syllables are comb or there, and then hail, quad. So then we have uh, hail and quad alliterating with each other. All right. Let's look at an English language example of Galdrilach. All right, here's my Galdrilach stanza in English. A holstered six gun and a hitch in my step and a story that'll stun you. A four wheel truck with worn down treads and a pass I can't push over and trails I can't travel backwards. So again, lines one and two have two uh, stress syllables each Pulsed, six, hitch, step, one stress syllable, and the odd line alliterates with a stress syllable in the next line. Pulsed, hitch, same thing with four and five. We have two stress syllables, four, truck, worn, treads, one stress syllable, and the odd line alliterates with a stress syllable in the next line. So truck, treads. And then in the third line, we have three stress syllables, story, stun, you, and then we have up to four unstressed syllables, and uh, e, o. All right, 
And then of course the same in the sixth line here. Uh, three stressed syllables, pass, can't, push, and then up to four unstressed syllables, and, uh, I, and then over. And of course we have two stressed syllables in the third and sixth line that are with each other. So story, stun, pass, push. But notice here that I've actually got an additional unstressed syllable because over takes up two of five here. In Old Norse, you can usually make two short syllables in succession count as one syllable. Now this is something that we don't really have in English, short versus long syllable. A short syllable in Old Norse has just a short vowel, so a vowel that's not long or diphthong, followed by no more than one consonant. So a word like fara has two short syllables. Since there's no real distinction made in English speech between short and long syllables, uh, the sort of equivalent that I use in writing in English with this is just to say that uh, a word that's very low stress, like an adverb or preposition like over, if it's two syllables, can just count as one. That's just sort of my English equivalent to this. And then I've done the same thing in this line, which makes it Galdr log by repeating the style of line six and trails, I can't travel backwards. I've got three stressed syllables, trail, can't, trav, two of those alliterate with each other, trails and trav. And then I've got five unstressed syllables, but I'm counting two of them that are next to each other as are two syllables and a weakly stressed word is one. So an, I, ol, and then I'm counting these two uh, and backwards as one unstressed syllable, even though it's just one weakly stressed word with two syllables. All right, let's take a look at skaldic poetry and its much stricter demands. Now, Eddic poetry is the kind of poetry we find in the narrative and didactic poems of the poetic Edda. Skaldic poetry was actually much more to the taste of the kings and nobles of the Viking Age. While Eddic poetry often tells a story or might provide advice, skaldic poetry is almost always occasional. It's based on some occasion. Often we're praising a king, praising a noble, praising some hero, talking about a battle that just happened, maybe talking about a gift that's just been received. It's usually sort of more a commentary on something that's happening right now. It's also a lot more complicated. There are many different meters. Uh, for instance, Snorri Sturluson explores 102 meters, I think, in Hotetal in the Prosetta. But uh, the most prestigious meter is called Drotkva, the kingly meter, the meter for a court. So I'm going to show you how Drotkva is done and you'll see this is vastly more intricate than the Eddic poems. So we have again an eight line stanza like four near the slog, but instead of having uh, two stressed syllables and then zero to four unstressed, we have a strict count of six syllables per line. It can be seven if again you have two short syllables uh, in a row that can count as one, but basically six is the rule. Each line has to end in a trochee, so what I mean is a stressed syllable then an unstressed, it's usually part of the same word. Old Norse is largely a trochaic language. Most words are trochees. English, not so much, but a lot of words are trochees. Viking is a trochee. Water is a trochee. Travel is a trochee. Uh, words that are not trochees include engage because the second syllable is stressed. So we have to end with stress syllable, unstressed. And that last stress syllable, the second to last syllable, is critical to constructing the entire skaldic poem. All right, in each odd line, two stress syllables alliterate with the first syllables of the next even line. So each even line must start with a stress syllable that alliterates with two syllables that are stressed in the preceding odd line. And then that second to last syllable really comes into play. In an odd line, the second to last syllable has to end in the same consonants as another stress syllable in the same line. So if the second to last syllable is say fight, it has to have another stress syllable in the line that ends in T, right? Mate or oat or whatever. In an even line, that second to last syllable has to actually totally rhyme with another stress syllable in the line. So in an even line, if our second to last syllable is fight, then another syllable in the line has to be bite or right. All right, so as you can see, this kind of strict requirement is not exactly conducive to using natural, normal language, right? It's very difficult to just decide, I'm going to speak an old throat crap, because it's really tough to find words that alliterate and rhyme 
uh, with this kind of frequency and especially fit them into just six syllables in a line. So for instance, what if I want to talk about Thor, but all that I'm left, you know, I'm constructing this poem in my head or, or on a piece of paper today, and all that I've got left are a couple syllables and I need something to alliterate with an H. Well, Old Norse poetry has a solution for you in the form of Haiti and Kennings. So before we can look at an example of a skaldic stanza, we need to understand Haiti and Kennings well. So in order to get the alliteration and rhyme that we need, we need to be able to call things by different names, especially gods, kings, uh, prominent natural phenomena like the ocean, the moon, uh, uh, the sky, etc. have Haiti in Old Norse. So these are elusive alternative names. So for instance, Thor, if we need to alliterate with something that starts with an H, or if we need to rhyme with something that ends in Or, we can call him Chloridi. This is one of his alternative names. Most of the gods have several of these that allow poets in the Norse language to alliterate and rhyme with different things. Uh, Chloridi, its exact meaning is a little unclear. It could mean something like uh, the, the loud uh, weather maker. Uh, this is like roar. This could be related to a word for storm. Uh, sometimes these Haiti just take the form of sort of optional name extensions. So Thor might be called Ving Thor if we need to alliterate with something with a V or if we need to rhyme or end with the same consonants as NG. Uh, this is probably related to an old word for fighting, so like fighting Thor. Odin has tons of Haiti. He has a, a huge number of names that he takes in different stories, uh, which he uh, lists at the end of Grimnismal and famously also in American Gods. Some of these names include Bolverker, which is evildoer, literally. Uh, Grimnir, which implies ha having a mask, is the one who goes in a mask or who goes with a shadowed face, a cloak. Uh, Hnikar, which is probably something like the, the one who makes angry, the angerer. Gauter doesn't necessarily have a clear meaning, but it seems to be from the same root as the name of the people known as the Goths. Uh, Odin has a ton of these, but there are also Haiti for natural phenomena, like the knights can be called Grima, uh, mask. This is just sort of a, a convention of skaldic poetry. A horse can be called by any sort of uh, color that is applied to horses. So in English, we might say, you know, a palomino, a buckskin, a roan. But in this case, in a skaldic poem where I'm using that to mean horse, I don't necessarily mean that the horse in question is that color. I might be talking about a bay horse, but if I need to alliterate with R, I might call it a roan, just because I'm, I'm alluding to the fact that it's a horse and this is a color that's used when talking about horses. We don't do this too much in English. Probably the closest thing to a Haiti in English is something like how uh, most English speakers know that the Big Apple means New York. There's not really anything about the words Big Apple that tell you it's New York. It's just sort of an agreed upon convention that that's an alternative name for the place. All right, so those are Haiti. Now let's look at one level more of wordplay, the kenning. So a kenning is a compact metaphor, and typically it takes the form of either a compound word, so the X, Y, or of a possessive phrase, the X of Y, or the X is Y. Let's look a little bit at what I mean by looking at some examples of the types of kennings. One very common type is the type that sort of says X is to Y as A is to B. Blood flows through a pen, excuse me, blood flows through a body like ink flows through a pen. So what's pen blood? It's the thing that flows through a pen like blood, so it's ink. Similarly, the very famous kenning that's found in Beowulf among other places is Whale Road because a road is to humans or horses, as the ocean is to a whale, so the whale's road is the ocean. Or one that's a little more uh, Norse style, raven, wine, humans drink wine, what do ravens drink? Blood, so raven wine is blood. Frequently, Kennings will have some kind of mythological illusion. It was actually Snorri's desire to explain a lot of these mythological illusions in Kennings that led him to write the prose edda and preserve a lot of the myths for us. So for instance, Wolf's tooth prop, you have to know the myth there, which is that Fenrir, the monstrous wolf that's going to eat Odin at Ragnarok, is imprisoned with a sword propping open his jaws. So the wolf's tooth prop is a sword. 
Otter's Ransom. You have to know the story that's in the Poetic Edda, the poem Regen's Mole, or in the Saga of the Volsungs, where a huge ransom of gold is paid for an otter. So Otter's Ransom is gold. Or Moon's Sister. Uh, you can maybe infer this is the sun just because the sun is feminine, but uh, in there's a myth where the moon is is guided by the or the moon is guided by uh, a brother named Moon and the sun by a sister named Sun. It's also category play. So for instance, I can switch something within the same category. One popular way of doing this is to talk about uh, ravens as some other kind of bird. So for instance. What's a wound swan? Well, it's a bird you associate with wounds, like with eating wounds, so that's a raven. What are the cuckoos of Odin? Well, they're the birds of Odin, so his ravens. Actually, this specific example in Old Norse, uh, the poem I got that from, it's Gauts Gaukar. So it's actually using a Haiti for Odin, Gauter, to make him alliterate with the word for uh, birds that's being used, Gauts Gaukar. So sometimes Haiti and Kinnings can really play together in uh, freeing up the skull to make uh, the image that he wants to make. Sometimes we have stock images that are very common. For instance, humans are often uh, spoken of as trees in Kennings. So uh, this usually takes the form of a man being called a uh, masculine gender tree, like ash tree, Oscar. So something like the ash tree of weapons, the ash tree of armor, the ash tree of shields. Whereas a woman will be called a feminine gender tree name, like birch tree, Bjork. So she'll be called like the birch tree of jewelry, the birch tree of uh, spinning, something like that. So you use a tree of the appropriate grammatical gender and associate that with an activity or item associated with that particular sex. Uh, there's also battle as bad weather. So for instance, uh, battle might be a storm, it might be a snowstorm, uh, it might be bad clouds, something like that. Axes are often uh, portrayed as monsters. So an axe might be the troll woman of the storm, right? So the monster of the battle. So it's an axe. Uh, a sword is often compared to a, uh, a snake or a jewel. This could also be sort of an uh, analogy of shape. Uh, that's another thing, analogy of image or shapes. The swords portrayed as snakes because those are long and maybe they bite. Uh, they're associated with jewels because they're bright. So the jewel of the snowstorm might be a storm because snowstorm is battle. What's its jewel? The sword. Uh, also leeks, that is onions with long stems, so also an, another long item. So kinnings can get really, really uh, dense. Uh, it's not uncommon for a kinning to contain another kinning. So for instance, we might talk about, just to make something up out of the examples that I just mentioned, we might talk about the cuckoos of the uh, storm of the troll woman. So what's the troll woman, the axe, what's its storm, battle, who are the birds, cuckoos of battle, ravens. Uh, these can even go six or seven layers deep. But these kinnings are necessary in order to fit a poem into the strict demands of Trokvat and other scopic meters. So let's take a look at an example of a real Trokvat poem. All right, now let's look at a real stanza of Trokvat. This is a stanza from the famous Njol saga, uh, this is attributed to Kori Solmundarsson, and in this poem, which is a lausavisa, just a single stanza rather than part of a long skaldic composition, uh, Kori is remembering his friend Njol, who was burned to death, and he is complaining about how he can't sleep because he keeps thinking about this. All right, bear with me. Well, for one thing, Old Norse word order is uh, very free in the first place, but because of the demands of skaldic poetry, we can move words all around uh, to, get, to get them in the right place to alliterate a rhyme with the things we need them to alliterate a rhyme with. Usually, we won't move them between halves of the stanza. So for instance, if you have a kinning in the first part of the first half of the stanza, its other part isn't gonna be in the second half of the stanza, but it may have parts that are three lines apart, uh, just in that same half of the stanza. So first of all, let's look at the uh, technical details. So each line, and there are eight lines, each line has six syllables. Kumr at ur of Allah. One, two, three, four, five, six. Notice that an R or an N or an L that uh, we usually read as a second syllable in English that comes after a consonant, like here, 
uh, in a third person singular verb or in a uh, masculine name in the nominative, that is not counted as a separate syllable. So this is one syllable, kmr, ulr, for purposes of poetry. Om, sima, mer, grima, one, two, three, four, five, six. Bed, hlidar, monk, baby, one, two, three, four, five, six. Bau, ga, sveden, o, augu, one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, counting this in as just part of this syllable. Sitz, brand, fidir, brendu, one, two, three, four, five, six. Bold, var, naus, o, hausti, one, two, three, four, five, six. Ek, em, at, minu, meni, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is one of those cases where two short syllables syllables that don't have a long vowel or diphthong and that end in no more than one consonant can combine to count as just one syllable. So here we can count either, it's either ek m is being counted as one syllable or m a is being counted as one syllable. And then minigr ni yal one, two, three, four, five, six. Again, not counting that r as a separate syllable. And notice that we need an older form of the name yol in order for this to be six syllables according to the Norse poetry which sometimes can actually help date poems based on the forms of names that we have to assume, uh, names and other words we have to assume in order to make the poetry work right. Okay, now each even line is going to start with a stress syllable that alliterates with two stress syllables and the preceding odd line. Alm, uller, all, right? Any vowel alliterates in the other vowel. Baug, bev, Bathe, bod, brand, brend, and min, mean, main. Okay, now the second to last syllable of each line is significant. In the odd lines, that second to last syllable is going to end with the same consonants as another stress syllable elsewhere in that line. Al, ul, bathe, plead. Brend, brand, and main, mean. Whereas in even lines, that second to last syllable is going to fully rhyme with another stressed syllable in that same line. Grim, seen. Aug, baug. Haust, naust. Usually an S at the end of a syllable isn't counted as part of it for rhyme and uh, for constant rhyme. In, min. And there you have a skaldic poem. But what has Kori, our poet and hero, had to do to make this such a beautiful, well-functioning skaldic poem? Well, he has had to use a lot of kennings and Haiti uh, in order to get all these rhymes and alliterations to work. And he's had to mess with the word order a lot, so bear with me here. Well, we start with a verb, kimr at, comes not, so it doesn't come. At can be added to verbs and poetry to make them negative. Okay, what doesn't Come. Well, Sveden, sleep, way down here is what doesn't come. And it doesn't come on to his eyes. So sleep doesn't come onto his eyes. And now the rest of this is a little more complicated. I, which can be reduced to just the letter K added to a verb. So mon ek, monk, I remember. And I am uler. Almsima, so he's calling himself Uller, which is the name of an obscure god of the elm string. So one strategy in Kennings, one, so I talked about how trees can be a sort of standard poetic image for men. Also, you can call a man by a god's name and then uh, like god's name of weapons. So the Odin of spears would be a man, the Norther of swords would be a man, the Balder of shield, that's a man. So here, Uller of some kind of weapon, that just means man, I the man. Uh, and then in this case, of course, all this means elm tree and see me as string. So what's the string of an elm tree, string of a tree? That would be, of course, a bow. So the god of a bow, I the man. Remember the bevi bethli dar bauga, the demander of the bedside of rings. So what's the bedside of rings? Well, that's a shield, because a shield might have circular uh, decorations embedded in it. 
So it's the bedside of rings, and then the demander of a bedside of rings, the demander of something weapon related that's a man. And then we also have a Haiti for knight. Knight can be called uh, Grima. Actually, I've written this a little bit wrong. I wrote that in the nominative rather than the accusative. So that's just knight, and this Allah actually goes with Grimu knight. So, altogether, sleep doesn't come on eyes of me. Here's mare, a to me of body parts, uh, way up here. All masked, which is knight. Knight is the masked thing, it's just a Haiti for knight. I being the god of the bowstring, so a man. I remember the offer of the bedside of rings. The bedside of rings is the shield. It's offer demander is a man. So that's our first half. I can't sleep all night. I'm remembering my friend. Now the second half, since the brand vivir, the torch wood, the fire wood of the ship of battle. So what's the ship of battle? It's a shield, vaguely ship looking thing that you use in battle. What is the firewood of a shield? It is a man. So since the men burned in autumn, nyal inside. So this goes way down here. This goes with this first half. It's not skipping half of the, of the stanza, but it is skipping between many lines. I am uh, mindful, remembering my pain. So since the men burned y'all inside, I am remembering uh, my pain, my suffering. Kimrat ulr of Allah, al sima mer grimu, beth lidar mank, bedi, baogas vebno augu, Sits bran with a brandu, bolvar naus o hausti, ek em at minumeni, minigr niol ini. And with all that work done, we've got a scaldic poem and we've got it decoded. Now let's give this a shot in English. All right, since scaldic poems so often glorify war and courage, I find that one of the easiest subject matters to talk about in a scaldic poem is hummingbirds, because of course they are among the most war loving of all animals. So here is a throat-fat poem in praise of a warrior hummingbird. I've got eight lines, six syllables in each one. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 I've got each even line starting with a stress syllable that alliterates with two stress syllables in the preceding odd line. Spite, spear, spare, part, pain, pine, war, wing, woe, and king, canned, clear. And then in the second to last syllable in odd lines, I'm going to end with the same consonants as another stress syllable in the same line. Spare, spear, Pine, pain, wolf, knife. Notice that scaldic poetry does let you carry over the first consonant of the next syllable as the end consonant of the preceding syllable if it helps you make a consonant rhyme like this. Lan, canned. And then the second last syllable of our even lines, fight, spite, these fully rhyme. Heart, part, fully rhyme. Mast, cast, fully rhyme, and wing, king, fully rhyme. All right, so what if I had to do, uh, in English, I'm not going to mess with word order as much as I would in Old Norse because English readers are much less tolerant of weird word order than uh, Old Norse speakers. But uh, I can do a certain amount of kinnings. So for instance, spear swallow is a kinning for hummingbird. I took the category bird and I just took a different, a different bird and I thought, well, hummingbird is a sort of, uh, you know, they have like spear noses and they're warlike, so a spear swallow. What's a swallow of spears? Bird of spears, a hummingbird. P 
pane of pine trees. This is actually a fairly stock Old Norse image for the wind. The wind is the torturer of trees. You can call it the torturer of firs, the tormentor of the spruce, the killer of the aspen, that kind of thing. So pain of pine trees is just the wind. And then heart dew. Dew is on grass like blood is on a heart, so blood. One of those X's to Y type kinnings. Uh, knife wing. So this is again thinking about a hummingbird as having sharp little wings and again implying their use in, in battle because they're aggressive birds. So knife wing, hummingbird. Uh, and then sky candle. Uh, sun because it shines in the sky like a candle shines down here. The clear landscape of the sun that would then be the sky and uh, I suppose that ends my kinning. So spear swallow not sparing spited foes and fighting. Is that pain of pine trees part of your own heart do? Knife wing are you woe fed? War's breath cast a master sky candles clear landscape king of all the winged. So if I were to just transfer that to sort of normal English without the kinnings, I would say hummingbird, not sparing, spotted foes and fighting. Is that wind part of your own blood? Hummingbird, are you woe fed, war's breath, cast the master, the sky, king of all the winged. I kind of like this. Spear swallow, not sparing, spotted foes and fighting. Is that pain of pine trees part of your own heart do? Knife wing, are you woe fed? War's breath, cast to master, sky candles clear landscape, king of all the winged. But you can compose scaldic poems or whatever you like, and I hope this inspires you to try it out, whether in English or maybe in Old Norse if you're really brave and know the language very well, or perhaps in another language all your own. I hope you'll also check out some other videos on this channel that concern other things about Norse language, myth, and poetry. I also have two books that involve poetry, of course, in Old Norse. There's the Poetic Edda, my translation of the Poetic Edda, which of course involves all Edic poetry. And then there is the upcoming Saga of the Volsungs and Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, which includes my translation of many skaldic poems, uh, which are in the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok, as well as Edic poems quoted in the Saga of the Volsungs. I encourage you to uh, always sort of look back over and reacquaint yourself with anything that doesn't quite seem right. One of the best ways to learn something is to do it again and again and again. It truly is a cliche, practice makes perfect, but in the case of poetry and study, it's true. Uh, for now, from the University of California, Berkeley, I'm going to be wishing you all the best.